Rob Baker is best known as the guitarist for the Canadian rock legends The Tragically Hip. Recently, Rob has resurfaced with his solo project Strippers Union with Odds vocalist Craig Northey for the first time in 10 years for a new album called The Undertaking. Dan Bochart checked in with Rob for an in-depth interview, but before we visit with them, let's take a peek at their classic music video for I Give You Away. have a new album out with uh, Craig Northey. Uh, yes. Called The Undertaking. Yeah, um, our third. That's your third album. Yeah. Uh, it's It's been 10 years since the last one too, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, good career move, eh? Yeah, well, a lot, <laughs> a lot of things have happened in the last 10 years as well, right? Yeah, for both of us, but yeah, it was a, it's been a strange time. Yeah. Um, so, so when did you uh, start thinking about doing this album? Uh, I wasn't even really thinking about doing an album. It was uh, while I was trying to deal with uh, all the things that surround the end of your career, uh, one that you didn't foresee and that involved the death of one of your best friends, uh, I was, you know, had a lot on my plate, a lot to deal with. <laughs> in a sense, I had nothing on my plate. But emotionally, I had a lot on my plate. And I felt like, well, my dream that I was able to live and pursue and achieve, uh, it's all gone now. I don't know what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. And all this stuff was kind of pressing in on me. So as a way of escaping from all that, I just came down to my studio and started doing one thing that I can be guaranteed will push all those voices away. Let me sort of insulate and find a happy place. And that's playing music, writing music, recording music. Right. And suddenly I had 40 or 50 demos. Uh, and I don't even really think of them as demos because I try and make each one a finished piece of music, make it as make it record ready, I guess. And uh, Craig happened to be coming through town with, uh, I think, the Art of Time Ensemble. And uh, I said, come and stay for two days. And in the two days, we knocked out lyrics for five songs. And then it seemed pretty clear, well, some of these songs are designed for a strippers union project. And maybe, maybe I should start thinking that way, start calling the ones that work for that and push others to another use so yeah you you were originally thinking about doing this all yourself weren't you i was and in a sense i did even even as a strippers union record strippers union has always been uh craig and i and uh pat stewart and doug elliott and then we would always have someone playing keyboards and usually a horn section and some female voices uh, this time I thought I'm going to do everything. I'll play all the instruments and Craig will just help me out with the lyrics and the vocals. Uh, as we got closer to the end, there were a few songs that it really felt would step up with real bass and drums. And I know Pat and Doug, they've been playing together uh, as, a, as a rhythm unit for 35 years. And they just have an intuitive sense. They work very quickly. So I put my hard drive under my arm thinking, well, I'll go out to Vancouver and we'll get five or six songs for bass and drums. And we did 17 in three days. And every single song they played on took a step up. You know, <laughs> I think my drum programming and my bass playing were fine, 
they were good and it could have come out that way, but it's better this way. Yeah, definitely sounds like it. Um, you, you got that recorded just uh, under the wire when this pandemic started, didn't you? I did. I actually, uh, those guys worked so fast that we were done in three days. I had given myself four days to get it done, thinking it was only going to be six songs. I gave myself four days. They did 17 in three days. So I rebooked my flight, came home a day early. And if I had come home on the original flight, there were two guys coming back to RMC who tested positive wow. on that flight. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, things might have gone very differently. Well, I'm glad they didn't. Um, so you produced this album yourself at, uh, at Bathhouse Studios. Um, yeah, I mostly produced it exactly where I'm sitting right now. I did all the instrumentation sitting right here. I did my vocals sitting here. Uh, some of Craig's vocals right here. We did the bass and drums in Vancouver. We did all the mixing at our studio in Bath. Okay. Um, that, that studio has uh, quite a history to it, doesn't it? It does. It started as the Hips Clubhouse. And we thought, you know, uh, the Tragically Hip was a little songwriting. We were a communist collective, essentially, where we shared everything equally, uh, including responsibility and uh, the workload. And uh, we thought, well, we need to own the means of production like any good little Marxists. <laughs> we need our own studio and we'll do it that way. So that's what we did. We set up a little clubhouse, a place we could keep our gear, go in and rehearse. Not that we rehearse much, but uh, record, hang out, come up with song right and eventually it became a commercial studio it's actually very hard for us to get into it now so it's it's busy yeah um yeah this lockdown is affecting everything so i imagine it's uh hurting that as well as far as uh, the business side of it um, yeah. craig is a great writer um i, I love the uh the lyrics in, in your music um do you do you find that that was part of the the attraction when you two first started uh, working together? Because, you know, working with Gord being, as uh, Ron McLean called him, Canada's Shakespeare. Uh, mm -hmm. Craig, Craig is quite the writer himself, too. He is. And uh, I think being in the hip, we were all aspiring songwriters. But uh, Gord's way with lyrics uh, was so unique that it kind of pushed everyone else down. There was no, no point in me trying to write lyrics because Gord could just do it so much better. So I focused on other things. And as a result, that sort of uh, aspect of my songwriting didn't develop at the same rate. So when it came time to sort of try and <laughs> give myself a creative enema and clear the pipes of all these songs that were building up, uh, I needed to call someone in to help with lyrics and who better. I, I was always a huge fan of the odds still am. And from the moment I met Craig, he felt like a long lost brother. He's the same age as me. Uh, you know, we, we were talking while we were doing the bass and drums for this record. We were chatting. I said, what's the first record you ever bought with your own money? It was the same record I bought first album I bought. So we just, uh, it was just a meeting of the minds, and it was apparent from the moment we met. And we just became great friends. All the guys in the hip were great friends with the guys in the odds. We admired them, and I think they admired us. But more than that, uh, there was just a, a kinship, a friendship. So I've always been a band guy. I never wanted to be a solo guy and stand in the spotlight. Uh, I love the band concept. That's my vibe. So if I was going to do something outside of the hip, it was going to be with a bunch of people that I loved. They had to be friends first and foremost. So Craig was a natural choice. So you don't think you would ever do a solo album, uh, like just like a solo acoustic type uh, thing? Yeah, I think I would actually. I think in the process of the last, you know, since the band ended, even before that, but really since the band ended, I've spent a lot of time in the studio chasing down ideas and some things 
feel like, oh, that would have been good for the hip. This feels like it's strippers union. This might be a good solo record song. And maybe this piece would sound good on the Weather Channel. Mm-hmm. You know, you, <laughs> you never know what's going to happen with your music. So some of it may be a soundtrack. You never know. And I don't rule any of it out. But I did. I wrote a bunch of songs specifically about Gord. Uh, and what I was going through and what that all meant to me. And uh, if they were ever to come out, that would be a solo effort. So. Uh, too Close to the Truth. Can you tell me a little bit about that song? Um, uh, what the lyrics mean? It, it sounds pretty relevant to me, if, if I understand it correctly. It sounds kind of like what we're going through today in society. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> it's in a sense it's on on its surface it's just a little sci-fi story that i had kicking around in my head that i pitched to craig almost like a movie idea uh, and it'd been kicking around for a long time with someone who's you know basically on an island up in georgian bay or someplace and it hasn't rained and the, the forests are like tinder and you're surrounded by water but there's nothing that you can drink you're you know, you're getting into a bad place uh, environmentally and you need to get out. But it's also, uh, I mean, that's the, the superficial sci-fi story. It's also about uh, talking about things without talking about things. Sometimes you, you have to skirt around what you're talking about. Right. A way of being political without being political. <laughs> yeah. Um, you you have a wonderful uh, backup singer uh, on this uh, album, uh, Miss Emily. Emily yeah. Pennell. How, how did you meet her and uh, start working with, with her? Because uh, you've known her for several years. Yeah, many years. Uh, I saw her perform once at a little bar, roadside, roadhouse bar in uh, Prince Edward County, Picton, uh, one time many years ago, and I was just absolutely taken by her big soulful voice and uh yeah a most pleasing person in every respect so uh, years later uh, we became friends and she asked me she asked Gord Sinclair to produce a record for her and uh, she asked me to be in the band for the album so I did that and I ended up uh, writing two songs on the record for for with her kind of the way I write with Craig where I come up with a finished musical idea pass it on if it strikes a chord with them they start writing lyrics and I pitch in where I can uh, so there are two of those songs on her last record and I fired her a bunch of ideas for her next record and we're in close contact awesome um, you, you've also been able to spend a lot of time with your son during lockdown um, I, I heard that you have uh, weekly uh, jam sessions or uh, uh, writing sessions. Yeah, we do. He, uh, I think he was, I mean, uh, he grew up uh, at shows. I never pushed him uh, to be involved in music. In fact, if anything, I would try and steer him clear of it because it's fraught with disaster for most people that go down that path. But uh, it's his passion. It's one of his passions, but it's the passion. And so he grew up around the live shows and then watching me down here. And for the last year, he's been locked down with us. And it's interesting to have your 25, 26-year-old son come back and live with you and really be stuck indoors <laughs> with you for a year. Uh, but it's actually been really fantastic. And he set up his own recording studio in his bedroom. And sometimes I'm up there with him working on things. And uh, once a week we get here in this space where I am right now and plug away at stuff. He's got a couple of bases right over here behind me. <laughs> so, so you, yeah, it's, it's great. It, just plugging away at ideas and uh, with the vague idea that maybe the two of us will put something out down the road. But uh, he has his priorities, which are probably more schooling, and uh, he also has a, 
an excellent band and they're plugging away at it. They're writing every week. So, uh, you, you have an extensive vinyl collection as well, don't you? Uh, I do. I, I feel so sad about some of it. I had about uh, 2,000 records at one point, and then I moved all those records out to the bathhouse studio, up to the, we have a snooker table, snooker table vinyl room upstairs, so you can pop on a record and play snooker. Uh, and that was an, a pretty extensive collection. And I started maybe two or three years ago, I started to rebuild my collection and uh, got a great system. And I, I just love it. It's, you know, nothing compared to it. CDs, you know, when cassettes came out and then it was CDs, uh, they were all just seemed so disappointing. Every, every time out, it, Every new format just watered it down more. And now everything's streaming. And I understand the convenience. I understand what draws people to it. Uh, it has a lot of pluses. But what the one thing that's really lost is <laughs> holding that album jacket in your hand, a nice piece of art, uh, and all the information, who wrote what, where it was recorded, who did the engineering, the studio, all that stuff that was so important to me that I spent so much time doing as a kid, fueling my imagination and driving my interest in music. So, Yeah, we're, we're the same age. So I, I went through the same experience as a teenager and I, I made the stupid mistake of getting rid of my vinyl when I was very late to the CD game. And then I got rid of my vinyl thinking, well, you know, nobody listens to vinyl anymore. And I've spent the last few years rebuilding my vinyl collection as well. And uh, yeah. I, I can't wait to get my hands on your, your album. I just ordered it the other day. Good. I'm really looking forward. Uh, you'll, you'll get, you got in under the wire. I think they're almost all gone. Oh, great. I only did a, I only did 1000. Yeah. And they're all signed and numbered. And when those thousand are gone, it exists only as a streaming thing. So that's awesome. Um, you're, you're working on a book as well, right? Uh, about yeah. your uh, adventures going. with the hip. Do you, yeah. do, you have a, do you have a story that you can share with us? Uh, I don't know if I'd share a story, but I talk, it's a, I didn't want to write a biography of the hip or an, a personal autobiography. Uh, so it's just a story that's, uh, the book is organized around places. And there are certain places that had great meaning for the band that we kept going back to, whether it was New Orleans or Chicago, certainly Kingston, Toronto, Vancouver, uh, Utrecht and Amsterdam were huge places for the band. And uh, each of those places comes with a host of funny stories, often uh, drunken misdeeds and, and silliness, but uh, a lot of laughing went down. And then there are other places uh, where there wasn't a lot of laughing, which figure in like the border, border crossings. Is the, the border years. ever funny? No, you don't laugh much at the border, that's for sure. And uh, we knew that going in, but the, uh, the very first time we crossed the border into the U.S., not the first time we crossed, but the first time we crossed as a band for a real band purpose, and it was to go down and make Up to Here, our first full-length album in Memphis, and we crossed at the Thousand Islands, which is our local crossing. And uh, we crossed there many times before. And they immediately pulled us out of the van, took us all into separate rooms and held us for three hours and told everyone a different story. We found a big bag of weed. We found a big block of hash. We found pills. We found everyone got all these different stories. None of it was true. They just, they completely toyed with us for three hours. We were sweating blood and bullets. And, uh, and they would say, one of the other guys says, it's you. <laughs> Everyone gets this story. And it was, it's really horrific. I can laugh about it now. In fact, we laughed about it about 10 minutes after it was over. But and they said, well, you've lost your van. You've lost all your gear. That's all been confiscated. And you're going to jail in the United States. But if you cough up what you've got, you can walk back to Canada. But your gear is gone. You're not going to make a record. 
And then after three hours, they said, okay, you can go. <laughs> and they let us cross because there was nothing. Yeah, that's Never was. Crazy. We never messed with the border. But um, The band did uh, invest in a marijuana production uh, facility, didn't, didn't you? Uh, we were uh, tied in with a company, New Strike. Uh, excellent people. Excellent company. And uh, they eventually sold to uh, a larger, you know, it's a, it's a funny time. This, and uh, the business, uh, you see all these fish and they're getting bigger and bigger, but there are bigger sharks swimming around <laughs> eating yeah. the fish and swallowing them up. And we kind of knew that that was probably destined to happen. But uh, when it did happen, uh, it didn't feel the same. We were in it. it in part because we believed in the project, but also because we believed in the people that were involved on our end that we went into business with. And when they were gone, uh, it's, yeah, we're free agents now. We're not, we're not uh, currently players in the industry other than on a private level. Right. Um question I wanted to ask you about the album. Um, why, why did you decide to release it in uh, two phases? Uh, <laughs> trying to outsmart. Uh, it, so much has changed in the music industry that, and with the move to streaming, basically when you release a record on streaming platforms, you get one kick at the can. If you release a double album, you get one kick at the can. If you release two single albums, you get two kicks at the can. <laughs> I had suggested releasing it one side at a time as four EPs to get four kicks at the can. Uh, I thought that was uh, clever, but apparently it was too clever by half. So <laughs> we're taking taking it as two separate albums. Yeah, that, that actually is pretty clever. I read recently that you didn't make any money off the first two strippers union albums. So obviously you do this because you love creating music and uh, being in a band such as the hip for a number of years, I'm sure that's afforded you the luxury to be able to do that. Right. That's the truth. Yeah. The first one was a big, <laughs> the first one cost me a lot of money. The, the aim for the second one was to break even, but that's also the aim for this one. <laughs> yeah. I didn't break even on the second one either. So, but uh, I'll break even on this one. And uh, I may, you know, I may make, <laughs> I may make a hundred bucks or a couple hundred bucks off this record, maybe if I'm lucky, but that's obviously not why I did it. Um, it, it never has been. I honestly, uh, playing music as a career choice, uh, it's treated me very well. I was one of the 1% of 1% who ca can actually make a go, keep body and soul together with money made. Uh, but I never thought of playing gigs and uh, writing songs as work. The work is sitting in a van, sitting in hotels, sitting in airports, sitting around waiting in dressing rooms. Uh, being away from your family and missing birthdays and anniversaries. That's what you're getting paid for. Getting up on stage with your best friends and playing music. I almost feel like we should be paying for that because that was just, it's a privilege to be able to, to uh, chase your creative life that way. Mm -hmm. uh, have you done anything uh, with the rest of the band? Creatively, have, have you worked on anything, or are there any plans to for a project with the other band members? Uh, well, I certainly I, I uh, played on a record. Uh, I was in Paul Langlois' backup band for a record and a tour that he did, and uh, I was in the band that Miss Emily and Gord Sinclair put together for that album that they recorded. Uh, I've played with Paul and Gord. Uh, at a couple of benefit shows for things, United Way and a few things here and there. We haven't got together to do any songwriting 
or to do anything really hip related other than we have a weekly Zoom call where we deal with ongoing business. And uh, while we are no longer a touring act and we're not writing and releasing new music, uh, there is lots of music in the vaults, songs that are unheard, tons of live shows that were extremely well recorded. Uh, there seems to be a hunger for that from fans and friends. So, uh, you know, our work's not done. We continue to merchandise and do other things. So, yeah, we have lots of business together, but we aren't writing songs together. Right. So there, there will be some new hip coming out, unheard, I should say unheard hip coming out in the future then. I would think so. Every single, every single record we went in to do, uh, we made it a point to, uh, you'd try and write 25 to 35 mm -hmm. songs. Uh, you'd hone it down to maybe the 17 best ones. Uh, then to one, once you were in the studio, after playing through everything once or twice, you'd usually hone it down to 14 or 15 songs, which you would record, get the best possible versions. And then you would cut from there and try and get it down to 11. So for every record, there are at least three properly recorded two inch tape versions of, of songs that didn't make the record. And often the reason they didn't make the record isn't a matter of quality. It was a matter of maybe, you know, maybe there's already kind of a funky blues number on this. We don't, we don't want to put two funky blues numbers or uh, it's a ballad too far. Or we have a straight up three chord rocker already. Why would we put another one on? So uh, uh, as I, these songs get revealed to me, someone revealed one to me the other day They said, uh, there's a fan video of a song that you guys did uh, 30 years ago. And I saw this fan video that someone put up. And first of all, the video was unbelievable. It was really good. But uh, I had no recollection of the song. <laughs> I was <laughs> like, hey, that's really cool. <laughs> good tune. Well, that was quite wonder a lot. I wonder why that didn't make a record. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sure the, the songs that you recorded and cut are all good songs. Like you said, they just in whatever they didn't fit the, the flow of the album or whatever you were in. Yeah. An album is its own unique thing and it's usually 10 to 12 songs and uh, you want it to be a little journey. You don't want too much of any one thing. That was our approach anyways. Thanks to Rob Baker and Dan Beauchart for that interesting conversation. That's all we have for you now. We'll see you next time. Uh...